welcome to another live presentation. We're going to be talking about something really important today, and that's about investing. And although it might sound like, well, that, that is kind of common, the reason for this is because I feel like a lot of people in my industry, not everyone, but I am, I am guilty of it as well, where when we speak to people, we're talking as if we're talking to the most sophisticated investor around because as a professional, you want to be able to speak to anyone who's at any level investing. But sometimes it's like, um, like we're talking over your head and that's not cool, not right. And I really want to make sure people understand what investing is because I do have people come up to me who ask me, you know, basic questions or they say, I really don't understand how this works or how that works. That's what this is for. So this is a live presentation. We've got I thought about this for beginner investors, but I think experienced investors after a 10 year bull market that is still going on, I think a lot of complacency may have uh, crept into people's brains. And I want to make sure that we also get a back to basics because back to basics is really important. Sometimes we start to get so deep in the weeds and so uh, into the sophisticated matters uh, of investing that we forget about a back to basics like rebalancing, um, diversification, and realizing that uh, we're all closer to our uh, financial goals. Okay. So let me also say that investing in an index, you cannot invest directly in an index, but you could invest in a security that mimics or tracks an index. I know that's a very subtle thing, but uh, I do have to say that as part of this presentation whenever I say the word index, okay? And I also have to say something for diversification. Diversification is a strategy that we use to mitigate risk, but in a generally down market, like a correction or a bear market, even with diversification, your account is still going to go down. So it doesn't protect you against a loss in a down market, but it does help make for a smoother ride over the long term. And it does help you avoid the situation where if one investment that you have completely blows up and goes to zero, uh, supposedly you'll have other investments that'll save you and uh, work out to your, your benefit over the long term. Okay. So that's why they say we don't put all our eggs into one basket. So let's get started. Okay. We don't want to talk above you. We want to talk about investing. So the number one thing that investing requires is to know your why. Because uh, in my experience, I, I've seen a lot of investors invest money and then they become disappointed when things don't go their way. I hear it all the time. It's important to know your why, because if you invest money and you put money in your 401k plan and you've got this nice nest egg, and the stock market goes down into a, a bear market. I'm talking, I'm not talking like a bear market that lasts for a couple of months. I'm talking a, a multi-year major event where it seems like every single day the stock market is going down and the news is always terrible and there's no end in sight. That's when you really need to understand your why to stick with your investments. And you might be thinking, well, why should I stick with my investments if they're just going to go down and down and down? Why don't I just get out of the market and when the bad news passes when it goes away I'll you know and the black clouds dissipate I'll just jump back in to the market. Well that comes brings us to a term called market timing which is very difficult to do and uh, I think all all stats and history has proven that uh, almost every single investor professional and re and consumer slash retail investor is a pretty lousy market timer. The idea is to hold on to your investments through thick and thin because ultimately you expect them to work out over time. Just because the stock market goes down and we're, and we're in a bear market or the economy is in a recession, it doesn't mean that the investments you have are bad. It just means you're doing what every other investor before you has had to do, and that is wait and give your investments time. Uh, if you know your why, like, you know, it's for your retirement, that's a long time off, or for your children's college education, that's a long time off. If those whys are really important to you, and presumably they are, that is what gives you the staying power to hold on to your investments through thick and thin. And if you're not really committed, you're going to be thrown off your game plan, your investments uh, a lot. And the idea is to be in an investment portfolio that you could stick with. I like to say, what good is an investment plan or a financial plan if you can't stick with it? Okay. Let's go to the next point, okay? Risk tolerance and time horizon. 
Now, you you may have heard of your typical investment objectives. There's your financial goals, which basically is answered in the why, knowing your why, which we just answered. The next one is risk tolerance, okay, and time horizon. Risk tolerance and time horizon go together. And think of it this way. Your time horizon is what determines your risk tolerance. So if you have an investment goal that's, let's say, you know, that's two or three years away or you have a child going to college and they're on, you know, they're already in, uh, in the middle of 10th grade, for example, you know, their time horizon, their goal is coming up pretty quickly. The time horizon is short, you know, in, in a year and a half, you may have to write a check, maybe even sooner uh, for that college. So therefore, should that money be in stocks, in something risky, in something um, less stable, or should it be in a stable investment like, like a money market? So that's something, you know, that is determined based on the time horizon, meaning your risk tolerance. So if you have a short time horizon, then you have a lower risk tolerance. So these these go hand in hand, okay? Um, so if you have a long-term time horizon, let's say you're you know 40 years old and you're investing for retirement, there's a good chance you have you know another 25 years till retirement and people are living longer. So once you retire, you could be retired you know for 30 years. I mean, not good wood, hopefully longer, okay? But the point is, the longer term you think, the more risk you can take, which means you have a higher threshold for risk, a higher risk tolerance. So time horizon determines your risk tolerance. So if you're, let's say, 25 or 30, even 40, I'll say even 50, and you're investing in your company's 401k plan, uh, you still have a long way to go. I'm not saying that a 25-year-old and a 50-year-old should invest in exactly the same way. But what I am saying, you still have a long time horizon ahead of you, so you could still take some level of investment risk, okay? Uh, let's take the next one. Um, what do you invest in? Now, this, this We could go on about this like forever because there's all kinds of investments. Before we get into investments, we need to ter determine something called your asset allocation. Asset allocation is a huge determinant of investor performance and, and, and account um, ups and downs, which we call volatility. You know, we love to use the word, oh, volatility. And a lot of people kind of scratch their head and say, what does it mean, volatility? Volatility just means the extent that your um, investments could fluctuate, could go up and down in value. So with asset allocation investing, it's how much money do you put into stocks, bonds, and cash? And, you know, the, the longer your time horizon, the more aggressive you could be, the more comfortable you are taking risk, you would have more in stocks and less in cash and less in, in bonds. Your stocks could be in the form of individual stocks. Like you might just want to say, well, I like a particular company and I use their product. So I want to want to own shares of that stock and you could buy a stock. OK, fine. You could also buy uh, packaged products either in the form of an exchange-traded fund or a mutual fund. Those are very similar. In a 401k, then most likely you are in mutual funds. But these are just packaged products. But I think of these more as tools. So I don't fall in love with a stock, even if it's uh, the stock of a company that I love, a coffee company, a, uh, a smartphone manufacturer. To me, the idea is these are just tools. I don't fall in love with any of these products. There's no emotional attachment. You know, just, you know, if you're building a house, you need a hammer, you need a screwdriver, you need a saw, you know, exchange traded funds, mutual funds and stocks. These are just your tools of choice uh, and you want to get the best tools you can for the right job. And then there are other tools like bond funds uh, or, or kinds of stocks you use. You might use large company stocks. You might maybe use uh, an exchange traded fund that mimics the S&P 500, for example, or one that uh, invests in companies that consistently grow and pay dividends, as, as you know, as an example. And maybe bonds, you might use an intermediate term bond fund. If you're investing in cash, you might use cash equivalents, uh, stable, steady investments like uh, CDs, savings account, money market, you know, very conservative, that sort of thing, something that you could count on maintaining, uh, no guarantees, but you could count on maintaining a stable valuation. Okay. The next thing is diversification. Diversification, again, doesn't protect you from loss in a generally down market, but it is a strategy that you can use to help reduce risk and help reduce uh, ups and downs, the volatility in your portfolio. 
So when one company's business is doing well, presumably another company's business could be doing poorly. And those two help weigh each other out. And then maybe you want to get into uh, smaller types of companies, like a small cap ETF that invests in companies that have valuations, you know, uh, less than $20 billion in value, for, for example. OK, so um, that's what that means to have diversification by investing in exchange traded funds or mutual funds or stocks that are in different sectors of the economy, different industries and companies that are of different sizes. And you can also add to that mix uh, international companies, emerging markets. You know, there's a lot more people outside of the United States than in the United States. So you can invest in emerging markets, uh, investments that invest in um, Southeast Asia, investments that invest uh, go into Africa, South America, China, et cetera. Uh, the, it's really up to you and how you want to set up your account, which tools, you know, the, again, these are just tools to use to grow your assets over the long term. And then another one I put here and is rebalancing. So what's rebalancing? Basically, what it says is you're selling, not necessarily selling the investments that are up and buying investments that are down because everything could be down, just investments could be down. Uh, could be lower to a different extent, but basically saying an investment that is representing a greater percentage of your overall portfolio, you could shave that one back down to that original percent and take that excess money and put it into investments that are below your original percentage target. That's what rebalancing is. And that's just a way of, of maintaining a steady um, risk profile for your overall portfolio. And now, the last ingredient in all this is your time, not necessarily your time horizon, but giving your investments time to work. Now, I realize time doesn't necessarily heal all wounds, but in, when it comes to investing, time does heal a lot of wounds. And if you think about it, every time we've had a down market in the United States, going back to the Great Depression, um, impeachment, Nixon, Clinton, uh, World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, uh, 9-11. The stock market has always recovered because you have people at these companies who are doing everything they can to be as profitable as they can. So the stock market has consistently recovered from every bear market in the past. So I don't really see a reason why that'll change, but you never know. The other thing is, Bear markets happen at inopportune times. So if you're a year and a half away from retirement or your child is, is six months away from going to college and you have all that money built up in stocks and then we go into a severe bear market, um, you're, you, you may be very disappointed in realizing that you have less money for your child's college. And the, the college isn't going to say to you, hey, you know what? The stock market's down. Your, your, your kid's 529 plan went down 30% really fast. So we're going to give you a 30% break on the cost of your child's tuition. No, they don't do that. They, they just say too bad. So it's up to you to make sure you don't get stuck in a bull market glide path that has made your portfolio um, riskier than it should be because the time horizon is shorter because you're closer to your financial goals. So I'll end this video. See you soon. Uh, for more information, check out clientfirststrategy.com. Mitch Goldberg signing off.